the green light on? Yeah. yeah. No. All right, so we could get started for the morning. So Jama Gomez is going to conclude his lectures on supersymmetric localization. Okay. So since today is my last day, I, I want to take the opportunity to again to thank the organizers for the, the invitation to lecture and for all of you to, for all the questions you've been asking on and offline. So before I, I continue today, is, is there any question about the lecture yesterday or any other lecture? I'm leaving today, so this is like your last, I know, there's email of course, but uh, feel, yes. Okay, so that, that we're going to discuss, maybe let, let's postpone that discussion to today. That today I'm going to discuss in more detail how you can, how to engineer 2,2 two theories to give you a Calabiao. So l l maybe let's postpone that for a second. Yeah. I, I, this is one of the, the topics of today. Any other question? Okay. So we are in the process of achieving our goal. which is to uh, compute the partition function of, on the two-sphere, on the round two-sphere, of two-dimensional n equals two, comma two, uh, Susie field, the field theories. For most of the lectures, we're focusing on uh, on in our interest at the end of the day in a conformal field theory so we can compute, we can extract information about the theory in flat space from the partition function of the two-sphere, but we can easily, we can do everything that I've, I've been doing for, for massive theories and also that, that has had a lot of interesting applications. Okay? So today we're going to start more systematically by uh, considering the theory Two comma two theories <coughs> in flat space time, and then we will have to learn how to upgrade this to the two sphere. Okay. So, and the two two class of models that you can study in in, in, in two comma two theories are these Landau Ginzburg models that we discussed yesterday. These are very simple theories with scalar fields and fermions that have a, a potential, and they describe certain critical points, uh, certain superconformal field theories. And in particular, just to say some word, um, so w one place where in which these theories enter is that when you study the space of conformal field theories, which through the connection with Calabiao is the space of scalar or complex structures of the Calabiao, there can be a special points. So usually there, there is a region. Actually, it's better to draw this picture like this. So there can be a region, say, where one parameter is very, very large. And we'll see a, a concrete example of this later. So you're familiar, you're familiar in, 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 in dualities that when you study the theory at various corners of parameter space, you may, you may have a good semi-classical description. So if I study a Calabiao model of space, near a certain corner of that space, or in the space of conformal field theories, you can have, say, a nonlinear sigma model description, where you have a good classic, semi-classical description, uh, so semi-classical. Of course, this is still hard because it's, an, it's a nonlinear model and you have to worry about instant and so on. Now, there can be other parameters where the theory is deeply non-geometrical. There is no sense in which there is a big geometry, but in, in string theory, one of the beautiful things about string theory is that string theory makes sense in non-geometric backgrounds. It does not need uh, a notion of a space-time geometry. All that you require is that you have a, uh, okay, in this context, a 2,2 two superconformal field theory. So what can happen is that the special points in the moduli space are described by an exact conformal field theory. Exact means that you can solve using bootstrappy methods like the ones that you've been seeing. And uh, this would give you, for example, uh, uh, minimum models. Okay, and this minimum model is an example of uh, SCFTs that can be given a Landau Ginzburg description. Okay, so that would be an example in which Landau Ginzburg theories connect with Calabiao modular spaces. 
So now if you have a, this lambda Ginzburg description with a parameter, then you can style the partition function on the whole modular space by doing the integral that I, I did be, before with that superpotential. Okay? So this lambda Ginzburg uh, theory is described by a certain twisted superpotential. It has certain parameters that parameterize this uh, modular space of, of, of the Calabial. And then that integral will compute the Keller potential everywhere here. Okay? So you can uh, style it around this point or you can style it around this point. Okay, and then the, the other class of theories that we will describe are n equals 2 comma 2 gauge theories. I will, and you will see why. Of course, these are interesting, th these are interesting to do in any, in any case, but uh, we will see how it connects with the main theme of the lectures. Now, one good thing about studying these theories is that this theory is literally, for, m for the most part, constructing the Lagrangian of this theory and the true transformation of this theory, you don't have to do anything when you're in flat space. Because what you can do is you can take the theory, uh, the four-dimensional n equals one supersymmetry that, you've been study that you studied last week and it's was and Bagger, and you do a, a dimensional reduction from four dimensions to two dimensions. Do people know what dimensional reduction means? So you just keep the zero modes of all the fields along the circle, and you just, whenever you see a derivative in that direction, in the internal directions, you, you drop it. And whenever you see a gauge field in the, in the two extra directions, you, you declare that guy from the lower dimensional point of view is a scalar. Okay? Now, in two, in, in, in two dimensions, there is something richer. Sorry? Oh, sorry. You mean tensile product? Yes, 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 yes. And all befalls and all kinds of horrors that, uh, yeah. In two dimensions, apart from the, what you learned from uh, Clay and Wes and Bagger, there is something extra that you can do that gives lots of richness to 2, 2 theories. And that's what introduces this uh, duplication uh, of I both in the, in, the, in the context of field theory of the, you have parameters that live in chiral multiples and twisted chiral multiples that correspond to the conformal manifold spine by exactly marginal operators that are in in twisted chirals and one that's in, in chirals. And in the language of Calabiao, is the, is, is, this, this is mirrors the fact that you can, in a Calabiao you can have either complex structure or color class deformations. Okay, so let me just briefly remind you how you construct such a theory. I mean, I'll do it at a fairly high level w without w writing all the variations of everyone, but uh, ju just, just to give you a picture of what's going on here. So what is the data? So in supersymmetry, everything is in multiplets. So in a gate theory, the, the, the basic multiplet, of course, is a vector multiplet. And that's usually noted by B, OK? And when you, when you write a gate theory, you have to tell me the vector, in order to specify completely the, 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 the gate theory, you have to tell me the choice of gate group. Then you have the, the, the multiplet that you already seen in four-dimensional supersymmetry, the chiral multiplet, phi. Remember, these guys obey and in order to specify the couplings of the, the chiral multiplet to the vector multiplet, you have to give me a representation R of the gate group. Now, this representation could be reducible. You could have NF quarks multiplet, for example. Okay. So this is where you would stop in four dimensions, and uh, you would know how to write the Lagrangian. Clay told you it's in Wesenbagger. The Susi transformations are, can be found. It, they're essentially fixed by dimensional analysis, and you just have to work a little bit to fix all the coefficients on Lorentz symmetry. Now, in one plus one dimensions, Again, because the Lorentz group does not mix the plus and the minus sign, I can give a distinct, uh, I can impose distinct supersymmetry constraints on, the, on, on a superfield. Okay? And this defines a twisted chiral multiplet which I called Y. And remember, this was a, is annihilated by d bar plus and annihilated by d minus. Good. 
And let me give you an example of a twisted multiplet that uh, is very useful, even if you don't have. Yeah. So, so w w a canonical example of a, of a, of a twisted chiral multiplet is the, what's called the field strength multiplet. So you have B is a, is a vector superfield. It has a gauge field. You can construct a, 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 a superfield whose bottom component is uh, the field strength, the curvature of that connection. So you can define something like sigma is d bar plus d minus acting on b. Okay, That's called the field strength multiplet. And this guy is a twisted chiral multiplet. Okay? And for example, if you want to write down the Young-Mills action uh, for, a, for a vector multiplet, you can write it very nicely in terms of this guy by just writing d for theta sigma 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 bar. So the, the, the Lagrangian for the vector multiplet can be written in this way. Okay? So a twisted chiral multiplet is something that, uh, this, this will be an example of a twisted chiral multiplet that is derived from the vector multiplet. Okay, so what are the parameters of these theories? Because at the end of the day, we're, we're interested in, in uh, studying this theory as a function of all the parameters, and we want to understand the physics of all the various parameters. So we have gauge couplings GI, which are the gauge couplings for the various gauge group factors GI. Okay? So you have one gauge coupling for each of the gauge, gauge group factors. Now, in two dimensions, the gauge coupling is super renormalizable. It has mass dimension. So it, it flows in the infrared to strong coupling. Okay? Now, in a, in a vector multiplet, in, in, in one plus one dimensions, you can have, in non supersymmetric theories, you can have a, a topological term. Just like, remember in the first lecture I described, there was a topological term in four dimensional gauge theories of the type F wedge F. In one plus one dimensions, you can have a term which is just the integral of f over the, over the two-dimensional space. In, in the context of supersymmetry, this coupling uh, gets, combines with what's known as the Faye-Eliopoulos parameter. Remember that the Faye-Eliopoulos parameter is essentially uh, multiplies the top component of the vector multiplet and is a supersymmetric invariant. Okay? So you can define a complex parameter theta over 2 pi plus i zeta this guy is couples, as I said, to the topological term in one plus one in two dimensions. And this guy couples in the context of supersymmetry to, the, to the, this is called the Faye-Leopoulos parameter. Did you, did you see this la last week, Faye-Leopoulos parameters? OK, yeah. OK. And actually, actually there should be an i here. Um, the topological terms always come with an i, because you have one derivative of time. And this guy can be written, just to be concrete, it can be written uh, in this way, essentially by, uh, by, by uh, so I define this twisted chiral multiplet capital sigma. So these couplings can be united in a twisted superpotential. So I'll have to find a way of distinguish the superpotential with the twisted superpotential. So I'll try to call the twisted superpotential with a very fancy W and the superpotential in a, in a more pathetic W. Uh, if I forget, please tell me. So is this fancy enough? OK. Say. okay. Uh, so these couplings can be written as a twisted superpotential with tau over 2 sigma plus complex conjugate. So the theory will, will have one such parameter, so we'll ha and we'll have one tau for each u1 factor in G, in the gauge group. Good. Then you can have superpotential couplings. So this is the, the pathetic W, so that's just a superpotential, which is a function of parameter z. And, and chiral multiplets phi. Yes? If G is non abelian. That's zero. That's well, uh, if, if there is no U1 factor, if there is no U1 factor, the trace of. I think this is a trace. Of the there should be a trace. Yes, here there should be a trace. Yes. 
So it, it, it is only couples to U1 factors. So now we have superpotential couplings. So phi are chiral superfields, and Z are background chiral multiples. Okay? And this, in the, in the applications that we will have later, will co correspond to the couplings of the marginal operators in parametrized by chiral multiples. And then we can have the fancy twisted superpotential. that couples to twisted chiral multiplets and the coupling constant, which is what we care about, coupled to background twisted chirals. And this would correspond in the application that we will discuss. So this would correspond to complex structure deformations in the Calabria language. This would correspond to complexified Keller class deformations. OK, and the Lagrangian is so the Lagrangian that involves this part we already discussed yesterday, right? It, I just wrote it down. For the, for the rest, it's just the dimensional reduction of the Lagrangian of four-dimensional equals one supersymmetry. So this theory has n equals two, comma two, super Poincaré symmetry. Okay, which is, which is parameterized by a pair of the spinners that are covariantly constant. So these epsilon and epsilon bar are the 2,2 supersymmetry parameters of the theory. Okay. One comment to say is that so this theory flows in the infrared to something. It can be flow to a gap theory or, or a conformal field theory, and it flows to a conformal field theory, a super conformal field theory. So uh, to uh, n equals 2, comma 2 superconformal field theory, if the U1 axial anometry, uh, the U1 axial symmetry that these theories can have, which is non-chiral, so there is the vector symmetry, which is non sorry, is non-chiral. The U1 axial is chiral. If the U1 uh, axial symmetry is non-anomalous, so this is something that we will have to be aware of when we try to construct. 2,2 field theories that are going to flow to a Calabiao. If they flow to a Calabiao, they'll have to be superconformal, and then th 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 there cannot be a U1 axial anomaly. Okay? Good. So now I'll give you a cookbook recipe of what a simple man like me would do to. If it, yes? It always flows or it flow? It always flows. So. I, will t I want to describe like the, 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 the simplest, the least for me, way of to construct how to construct this theory on the two-sphere. Because now that, that's what we have to do. We have to kind of embed this theory on the two-sphere. So I'll, I'll give you like a cookbook recipe in general. Actually, the, the, the recipe I, I'm going to tell you would apply if you want to study uh, any theory in any dimension and you want to put it on the sphere supersymmetrically. So, first you start with geometry. So, the, the, the Lagrangian should be the last thing, not the first thing. You should not care about the Lagrangian until the last possible second. First, you, you care about what the geometry and what the symmetries are. So, first you worry about the geometry. So, so the first thing that we're going to do is actually write down something that's completely canonical. You know, people in Mars will discover the same transformations as, as us, which is to find the. Uh, Superconformal geometry. So we, we went from super Poincaré geometry, now we want to describe superconformal geometry. And what we have to do is generalize the killing spinner equations to the conformal killing spinner equations. So these equations param will parameterize the superconformal transformations. Um. Yes. 
Now, one important property of this equation, the, 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 and this is called the conformal killing spinner equation. Now, this equation is conformal invariant. What do I mean by that? It means that if I perform a wild transformation e to the 2 sigma x, g mu nu, and epsilon is charged this way, then this equation is well, well invariant. Okay? And the solution to these equations parametrize so the solutions. So this, 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 this can be solved very trivially in flat space. The solution is a constant spinner. Okay? Actually, this constant spinner would correspond to what? Can someone tell me? The constant spinner would, would parameterize which subset of the superconformal transformations? The Poincare supersymmetry. Yeah. And then there is a, a term that is linear in the coordinates. That this would parameterize the conformal supersymmetries. The supersymmetries that you get when you commute Poincare supersymmetries with the special conformal transformations. Okay. And now, if you want to know the conformal killing spinner on, an, on any other conformally flat manifold, you just do that. Just rescale with the conformal factor. Okay? Now, how do I extract from here the, super, the, the, super, the, the superconformal algebra? Now, given these spinners, uh, spinners, I can define a vector, canonically a vector, which will be epsilon tilde gamma mu epsilon. Now, what is this vector? Can someone tell me what this vector, what, what equation does this vector obey? The, the what? Equation. The conformal killing equation. The conformal killing equation. So, psi, psi mu is a conformal killing vector. And now you can prove this just by using this equation. Knowing that epsilon and epsilon tilde satisfy the conformal killing spinner equation implies that zeta satisfies the conformal killing vector equation. This is the poor man, or, or the kind of the geometrical way of saying the superconformal algebra. Because if I, that, that's just a statement that if I make two consecutive superconformal transformation, su, uh, super yeah, super transformations, you're going to get something on the right-hand side, right? And what you get on the right-hand side is exactly a conformal transformation. Okay? Good. Oh, why do we have a mess here? Now, okay, so now is the geometry. Step number two, we have to realize the transformations on fields. We have to real realize the superconformal algebra on the field. So we know what the parameters of the transformation are, are, are epsilon, epsilon tilde that, that obey that equation. And that also is canonical. So, so far, everything is canonical and, and fixed by symmetries completely. There is no guesswork here. Um, so the second step is to want to realize superconformal transformations, superconformal algebra on your multiplets, on your Poincare multiplets. So the vector, the chiral, and the twisted chiral. And this is ca completely canonical given Poincare transformations. So how, how do you construct them? I'll just uh, tell you in words. So, so you, know, you know the Poincare transformations. Now you can imagine uh, putting the theorem curved space. So you, you cover entities with respect to the metric. But that, that's not good enough. Why? Because it's not well covariant. So imagine now I'm, I do a wild transformation of this type. I already told you that epsilon has charge a half. And now in general, fields will carry some wild charge, some wild weight omega of this type. OK? Now you have to demand that the Susi transformations that you started in Ponca with the, your Poincaré transformations are covariant with respect to this transformation. Imposing that they are covariant with respect to the, 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 this transformation adds extra terms to the Poincaré transformations. So let me give you an example. So if you look at the vector multiplet, in, uh, for example, in the, in the variation of someone, the uh, who must be this, a scalar, you have something like delta of, of someone gives you epsilon tilde 
d slash lambda, okay? Epsilon tilde is the suicide parameter, and lambda is the state gate geno, okay? Now, imagine I do a, a, a wild transformation. Lambda will carry some wild weight, okay? But now this derivative will act on lambda, so there will be a term that will come out homogeneously, but when d acts on, on sigma, you have a problem because you generated something that is non-homogeneous. But what you have to correct it to make it homogeneous is, is, uh, is completely uh, fixed. And in fact, what you have to do is just add this term. This term will precisely cancel the sigma derivatives of, the, of this term. Okay. Likewise, for a, for a chiral multiplet, there is also in the, in the variation of the, of the fermion, you have something like this, if you remember, like the derivative of, of, the, scale, of the complex scalar in the chiral multiple times epsilon. And here again, phi will carry some wild weight, right? Again, you'll have the same problem and you have to correct it. And uh, it's always, but now the coefficient that you have to put here will depend on the wild weight of your multiple. okay? So you see, if you know your Poincaré transformations, you know to immediately write down all the transformations, all, all the superconformal transformations, okay? And now that you, you, have, you have a representation of the superconformal algebra on the fields. What do I mean by that? I mean that if now I take these transformations that are, I, I, I derived by just demanding wild covariance, if I look at the commutator of two such superconformal transformations on any field, what are you going to get? You're going to get some Lie derivative, some translation generated by psi, that psi is the same psi I wrote there, which is a conformal killing vector. You're gonna get a U1A transformation. I'm not writing the parameters of the transformation. You're gonna write the parameters of the transformation as some spinner bilinear of epsilon and epsilon bar. Here I wrote down the, the, the bilinear, which was epsilon bar, epsilon tilde, sorry, epsilon tilde, uh, gamma mu epsilon. You get a U1B, transformation. This had to be because the, the n equals 2 comma 2 theories have a, U, have a U1 axle and a U1 vector are symmetry. You can get a wild transformation and because of quirkiness of uh, working out things in components, which is what a poor man like me does, uh, you have to add a compensating gauge transformation. Okay? So we have found a representation of n equals to comma to superformal algebra on all our multiplets. And we never had to learn about supergravity or, or any of those horrors. Okay. Now, now, now will come the, 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 the non-trivial part, the more non-trivial part. I mean, th this is completely elementary. Uh, now we want to put this theory on the two-sphere. But we know from the beginning that we're going to fail. We are, we are not going to be able to put a gauge theory on the two sphere preserving uh, superconformal transformations. The, the ga gauge theory the, the in two dimensions has a, a dimension full coupling constant, so it cannot be conformal invariant. Okay? So we'll do the best that we can. We will, write, we, will, we will demand that the theory is invariant and the, la and the largest possible supersymmetry Transformations that close to isometries, not conformal transformations, okay? And for uh, n equals 2 comma 2 superconformal algebra, there are two ways of doing that. I discussed this a bit before. Uh, you can either uh, get what I call the SU2B massive subalgebra. So this will be the most general supersymmetry transformation that a massive theory could have on the sphere. You cannot have anything bigger than that, okay? Or, but there are two choices, or this other one. One preserves uh, U1B, the other preserves U1A, okay? And these are inequivalent. If I give you the theory in flat space, which is one, and I put, if I, and now I try to construct the Lagrangian of that theory while preserving this symmetry or this symmetry, the Lagrangian will be different. Okay? You get two different theories, and that's good, because these two, as I, as I showed earlier in the lectures, 
These two theories, at least in the case of conformal field theories, compute different things. One is the Keller potential in the, in the Keller modular space, and the other one is the Keller pot uh, and the other one is the Keller potential in the complex structure modular space. And this makes sense because I started with the theory of flat space. I define two different UV theories in the, on the two sphere, and they compute different things, indeed. So more concretely, what is this algebra? So SU21B is a pair of supercharges that are Dirac spinners that square to this, okay? So let me write and then I'll explain. Am I being careful with factors of two? Probably not. Anyway, so you have two supercharges, so there are four component spinners here, two comma two, and they square to this GI is an SU2 symmetry. This SU2 is precisely the symmetry of the, of the two, the isometries of the two sphere. So I projected out all the crap that has to do with conformal transformation in the two sphere, and this R is the U1 vector R symmetry, okay? Yes, thank you. Notice that this is interesting. This is, looks rather different than uh, the supersymmetry in flat space. In flat space, the R symmetry is always an outer automorphism of the Poincaré <coughs> algebra. What I mean is that R never appears on the right-hand side of anything, right? R acts on, say, the supercharges, but R never appears on the right-hand side of the, of the supercharges. Here it does. And this has important consequences when we discuss supersymmetry on, on the sphere. Okay. And just to motivate that this is not completely insane, now I can make a contraction. I can make my two sphere very, very fast, very, very big. I should recover Poincaré supersymmetry, right? And uh, you, so you can go to Poincaré, super Poincaré, by what's called uh, a contraction of the algebra. So you take, you rescale Q alpha, this is a strict three dimensional analysis, but Q alpha tilde root G, and then I take uh, Ji, the rotations to uh, factor of R, yeah, R, epsilon, Ij, Pj, and J3 to J3. If I plug this in here and take R to infinity, you get precisely the 2,2 two super Poincaré algebra, which of course has to be true. Okay, so we're cooking with gas now. Um, oh, okay. So now, so now we're ready to construct the, the Lagrangian for the theorem to two sphere. All that I have to do, I have my transformations, okay? But now I demand that, are, that the transformations are only invariant under this subset of the transformations of the superconformal algebra, okay? And those, we know, we know what they are. Uh, say for SU, for, S, for SU 2A. So this will be the general transformations. For SU 2 1A, will restrict, is generated by those transformations where eta is I over 2R epsilon and eta tilde is 1 over 2R epsilon tilde. What does this do in practice? If I go now to this equation and I use the spinners generated by that, this psi will no longer be a conformal killing vector, will be a killing vector. Okay? That's why I, I chose this one. I wanted to kill the conformal transformations. So that's a nice exercise you can do. You can, you can prove that if you choose uh, the spinners in this way, that then psi becomes a, a killing vector, not a conformal killing vector. Okay, maybe before writing the Lagrangian, I should do something more elementary or more, uh, more important, which is to connect this story with the idea of realizing an uh, interesting nonlinear sigma model. So, so now let's go back to the problem of realizing nonlinear sigma model from an RG flow. of, a, of, a, of a two-dimensional gauge theories. Because at the end of the day, that's what we want to do. We're interested in studying some particular nonlinear sigma models, concretely Calabria manifolds, but not, 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 not exclusively Calabria manifolds. And we want to know how do, how do we engineer these theories. I mean, 
you have the nonlinear single model definition, but that's not a very useful definition. You know, the nonlinear single model has a, something in the front called GIJ. We have no idea what GIJ is for a Calabiao, so it's kind of uh, not a very useful definition. So we want to embed this highly nonlinear theory in a nice gauge theory that is, uh, at least in, uh, at very, uh, very short distances, is a perturbative. Okay. So how we do this? Let me, let me start with a, a, a simple example, which is CPN. So, but, see, this sounds scary. CP1 is otherwise known as a two-sphere, okay? So what is CPN? CPN is a compact space. It's called uh, a homogeneous space that is defined by a collection of homogeneous coordinates. It has n plus one coordinates that are non-zero. And they're subject to an equivalence relation of this type. Where lambda is a non-zero constant parameter, okay? So you get uh, an n plus one tuple of complex coordinates and you identify them up to a non-zero complex parameter, okay? That's, that's, that's CPN. Now l l let's try to, to proceed and, 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 and do a partial gauge fixing, if you wish, of this ambiguity or this redundancy. Let's fix the scale. So this lambda has a scale and a phase, right? So let's fix the scale. So I can fix the scale by taking the sum of all these complex coordinates from 1 to n plus 1 to be a constant that we will call zeta. And this is not an accident, OK? So th this fixes the scale, but we still we still have to quotient but by the residual gate symmetry or the residual redundancy, which is the U1 phase rotations, right? So in this language, CPN is this space divided by the following U1 transformation, a rephasing of all the coordinates by the same charge, okay? So that's a CPN space. So now the idea is, can we engineer a gauge theory such that the space of ground states of that theory, and therefore at low energies, the permutation of the, of the light fields is CPN, okay? Can someone try to give me a, a guess of what, the, uh, what it is? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so essentially the question is, he, he gave the correct answer. I'm just going to explain the answer now. He, 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 was, he answered the question. So. so the point is, if you're a physicist, this looks like a potential, like a Mexican hat kind of potential. And you have to question by this. This is a residual gate symmetry. So now you can try to engineer a potential of this type, um, where, where you question by this residual uh, ambiguity. And that you can do the following way. You can take a U1 gauge theory. with uh, charge fields phi 1 up to phi five, five, 5 that carry charge under the U1, all charge 1, OK? This is a 2,2 two two theory. I'm, do I'm doing a, a supersymmetric version of the CPN model, OK? Um, now, this theory, in supersymmetry, the potential, there are two contributions to the, to the, to the potential. There is the T term that comes from the vector multiplet, and then there is the contribution that comes from the superpotential. Well, here there is no superpotential, so I have nothing to worry about. And if you remember from last week, the D term essentially is completely fixed by the charges of your fields with respect to the U1 gauge field. Okay? So the potential will look like sum of 1, because all fields have charge 1, will be phi i square minus the phi Heliopoulos term square. Right? So now, what is the space of ground states? Well, the, the space of ground states is when this guy inside the brackets equals zero. So that's precisely the, the top here. But we're not done because we, we have a gate symmetry, so we have to quotient by the U1 gate symmetry. We have to quotient th this uh, space by the U1 gate transformations, and that precisely gives CPN. 
So what we have found is that this gauge theory at low energies has a collection of light fields that parameterize CPM. All the massive fields have mass of order g squared times zeta that becomes very heavy as you go to the deep infrared. Yes? Oh, sorry, yes. I was doing the quintic already, sorry. Thank you. Yes. So this uh, idea generalizes an, in a large number of directions. So let me, so I'm always going too slow, but uh, what do I want to say? What I want to say is that one way, one famous way in which you can re represent Calabria manifolds, forget about physics now, just mathematicians, is that you can take a projective space like CPM and you can re represent a Calabriao as a hypersurface in that space. Okay? That defines a Calabriao and you have to impose certain topological conditions for the space to be a Calabriao, but it can be represented as some hypersurfaces in, in say, CPM. So let me just write down what the, an, exa uh, an example of a Calabriao. By the way, th this construction of realizing a, linear, a non-linear sigma model by a two-dimensional gauge theory is called a gauged linear sigma model. Linear as opposed to non-linear, okay? Linear is good, non-linear is bad. Okay, so th the example is kind of one of the simplest Calabriaus that you can consider, which is the Quintic. Do you know how to spell this? Quintic in CP4. So let me tell you just geometrically what this guy is. So this is a Calabriau man it's a compact Calabriau manifold, okay? It has one Keller deformation, which you can understand from arising from the ambient CP4, where this uh, thing is embedded. And it has a shitload of complex structure deformations, 101 complex structure deformations. What can I do? Uh, okay. And now, wh wh what is this thing? This thing is essentially, you have CP4, and you have a, a hypersurface defined by a homogeneous polynomial equals zero, where these zi are the complex structure parameters. Okay, so now I'll, I'll leave this maybe as an, as an exercise to convince yourself of the following. Ah, okay, so this, so in, okay. So now I want to engineer a gauge theory that would flow in the infrared to such a, a gadget, okay? So first I have to somehow engineer CP4 because CP4 is, is, is lurking in the background. So what am I going to do? I'm gonna take a U1 gauge theory, I'm inspired by that, with five scalar fields, with charge, one, 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 okay? Well, that's not good. That's not good because I said that, uh, that uh, in order for this to flow to a SCFT, there, there cannot be a U1 axial anomaly, okay? So I have to add an extra field to cancel the axial anomaly. So I'll, I'll add a field which has charge minus five. So then the U1 vector and U1 axial symmetry, the U1 vector, of course, is always uh, non-anomalous, but the U1 axial symmetry is non-anomalous, okay? Okay. Now, so this is the gauge theory. This will, get, this will give rise to a potential, which is again is the D term square. Now there'll be an extra contribution from this cookie P field, right? And also it comes with a minus sign, so this will do interesting things, okay? So you have the D term, and then you also wanna have, uh, okay, so a D term, and then I add to my theory a superpotential, which is precisely this G that mathematicians told us defines the quintic. On, as a hypersurface, times p, okay? And I have the two sets of potential. So uh, this, is, this is where the complex structure deformation parameters are gonna be buried in my gauge theory. And then I have a two sets of potential, which is what I wrote before. Oh no, uh, I guess I was doing it fancy. What was it? Like this, okay. G depend on, this, X, what, what is X? Oh, sorry, I made a mess, yeah, so this, did I call, yeah, they call them phi, sorry. Everything is phi, everything is phi, yes. 
So the, the potential is this plus dw squared equals zero. So now, now you can study the space of vacua as I tune one of the parameters. And this connects to what I was saying there before at the beginning of the lecture, where you have a geometric phase and non-geometric phase. Now, by studying this potential that's completely explicit, you know how to compute d because you know the charges of everyone. And you know how to compute the potential because I just told you what it is. Okay? The thing I want you to convince is that if you study this theory as a complex function of the parameters zeta plus i sigma, i theta, sorry, over to pi. So theta is periodic, so this is the circle coordinate, and theta goes up and down. Okay? I want you to show that, uh, that when theta goes to plus infinity, I get precisely the space of ground states, the quintic geometry. So in one region of parameter space, I get precisely the uh, 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 representation of the geometry that I wanted to realize. And in this other phase, I get some London Gisbrook model. And all you have to do is uh, see, uh, study a potential of this theory and, and uh, determine who is light and who is heavy, and who is light determines the geometry, essentially. Very good. And this can be generalized, again, in an infinite number of directions. The gauge groups can be made non-abelian. I mean, it's, it's a very, very rich subject. And, and this is uh, very good for, for us, because uh, essentially what this allows us to do is to uh, represent uh, nonlinear sigma models of geometries that we don't know how to study in terms of theories that maybe we, have, maybe we, we succeed, we have a chance of, of studying. Okay? So if the, this, if you wish, was a detour of how gauge theories connect to nonlinear sigma models and, and concretely to Calabiao geometries. So now that we have, constru we constru we have constructed the Suzy transformations on the two spheres, we have to construct the Lagrangian. And that, you have to work. I mean, that there is no... Well, so of course, the, the Lagrangian will look, of the, will look of this form. So the Lagrangian of the two-sphere will look the same as the Lagrangian in flat space, covering on the two-sphere, plus terms that have corrections of order 1 over L, 1 over R, or 1 over R square. That this is enough is essentially fixed by, by dimensional analysis. Yes? Yes, that's called the mirror automorphism. <coughs> yes. So that like effectively switches basically Keller and other structures on the side. No, that's mirror symmetry. That's, that's a different yeah. story. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Well, that, that, uh, so the, the statement is that the n equals 2 comma 2 from algebra has an outer automorphism that swaps uh, U1a and U1b. And he says that, uh, that that relates the parameters, the killer parameters, the complex structure parameters, and the answer is no. Well, first of all, the, num the parameters are not the same. It relates the complex structure parameters of one Calabiao to the killer parameters of some other Calabiao. Yes? Well, you, you, you have to worry about fluctuations around it, and yes. you have to study them. So, you have, so my point is that you think any of the sigma square and phi square. Yeah, OK, but yeah, there is, there, you're right. So there's another term in the potential that comes. I, I didn't say what sigma is, but it is a scalar field in the. In the, the sigma is the noise component of your practice. Sorry? So the sigma is the noise component of your practice. No, no, but no, sorry. This is here. So this is here. You're talking about the Fayeliopoulos term? No, that's zero. I put that to zero. F is zero. No, I put to zero. I'm going to look at the background configuration. The field strength is zero, OK? L let's discuss it later. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the vacuum state. I put the field strength to zero. Because it, it, it comes as F squared in the Lagrangian, F is zero. The, the, the Hamiltonian has to vanish. I have to put F to zero. OK, so. The fact that you have 1 over r and 1 over r square corrections uh, is essentially fixed by dimensional analysis. And here you have to work a little bit. Essentially, what you have to do is we, we construct the canonical transformations. We act on the flat space Lagrangian. That's not going to be invariant. And then we have to correct it by another procedure. Okay? So l let me just write the answer for the vector multiplet, the bosonic part of the vector multiplet, just so that you see that things are very concrete. So you have 1 over 2 g squared with the young mills coupling the integral over space-time, 
This is the, the metric on the two sphere. And I'm going to write it already in a suggestive way uh, for later. So I have f. OK, so th the vector multiplet is a dimensional reduction of the four dimensional equals one vector multiplet. So we'll have a gauge field, two scalars. I'm going to call sigma 1 and sigma 2, uh, gauge genus, and the auxiliary field d. OK? So the Lagrangian looks like this. Trace of f minus sigma 1 square plus uh, d, d mu sigma 1 square plus d mu sigma 2 square minus the commutator of sigma 1 and sigma 2 square plus d square. So essentially the Lagrangian is the same as the Lagrangian in flat space, but you have two new terms that you have to add. One that goes like 1 over r, which is of the type f times sigma, and a, a mass term, if you wish, for sigma, for, for sigma 1. Okay? You can do exactly the same exercise for the chiral multi for everyone essentially for the chiral multiplet. Uh, for the okay, and a, and a point that's important here for the twisted for the twisted chiral multiplet we already did it yesterday. Remember that I showed you there was a one over r term uh, in the twisted potential, so that has to be done through the theory supersymmetric. And one thing that's interesting is that the superpotential, the use of superpotential, is supersymmetric if and only if the r charge and the U1B of the superpotential is 2. And it has no 1 over R corrections. Can, so, can someone tell me why, 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 why is this required? First of all, is this required in flat space? In flat space, uh, do, you, do, do you need to preserve the U1R symmetry in order to have supersymmetry? Sorry? Sorry? I'm not hearing you. No, the question is, do you need R symmetry in flat space for the theory to be supersymmetric? No. So, sorry? No. no. And the reason you don't need it is because the R symmetry is an outer automorphism. It can be there or not there. Here, we, we are stuck with it, right? Because the supersymmetry algebra on the sphere has the R symmetry here, OK? So the theory will be supersymmetric only if the, the superpotential has the, 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 the right R symmetry, essentially. Good. So at least schematically, we have an idea of what the Lagrangian is, and it has small, small but important corrections to the Lagrangian in flat space. Now let's prove uh, some decoupling theorems. What we're interested in computing, so now we have the Lagrangian. We can try to carry out our uh, program of computing it by supersymmetric localization. But before computing, it's always good to understand what could the answer depend on first before computing anything. So what I'm going to study first are the coupling theorems. Essentially, I want to understand what the partition function depends on. But uh, yeah. And by the way, if you, you could try to do the same exercise here, not for the theory that preserves you one vector, but for the theory that preserves you one axial, you get a different Lagrangian, OK, obviously. So the first statement is that because uh, the the vector multiplet is Q exact, where Q now is a supercharge, is one of the supercharges in my supersymmetry algebra that squares to a rotation around one of the, a, a, a rotation plus R over 2. So J3 rotates like this, has fixed points north and the south pole. Okay. So and now I'm going to try to localize with respect to one supercharged Q inside LGU2 slash 1. Okay? The Lagrangian is Q exact. What does this mean? It means, again, by, by supersymmetric word identities, that the coupling constant that multiplies the vector multiplet, which is the gauge coupling, the partition function doesn't depend on it. Okay? So it means that Z is independent of G. Okay? So that means, and G is dimension full in, in one plus one dimension, so it means that it doesn't depend at all on the scale. So it means that the partition function computed in the ultraviolet is the same as the partition function computed in the deep infrared, which by this GLSM connection to nonlinear models is the same as the partition function of the conformal field theory that we were trying to engineer. Okay? And therefore, even though the theory becomes strongly coupled in the infrared, 
we're able to compute the partition, well, we haven't done it yet, but in principle, if you're able to compute the partition function in the deep UV, you have captured information about the strongly coupled theory in the infrared. So for the SU21 theory, what you find, and that's also something that we expected and you can prove, is that the superpotential is Q exact also. What does this mean? It means that the partition function of the two sphere uh, that where you preserve V does not depend on complex structure moduli. And this fits perfectly with the thing I proved already before that this partition function computes the Keller potential on the, on the Keller modular space, not the complex structure modular space. But now the point is that the Lagrangian of the fancy one, the two potential, is not Q exact. So the partition function uh, will depend on. Two things, the twisted superpotential that encodes the Keller deformations, the, the Keller structure deformations, and the R charges. Well, I only discussed this too much, but uh, chiral multiples, as you know, can be given R charges, and it will depend also on the R charges of the chiral multiples. Okay. And this uh, makes perfect sense again because ZSV was supposed to compute the Keller potential for the twisted chiral multiplets, which correspond to the Keller deformations. Okay, so let me sketch how this computation is done. Uh, let me make sure I don't erase that. Okay. So what do we have to do? We have to add a deformation, a Q, a Q exact deformation to our, our, our Lagrangian and essentially study the space of zero, zero energy saddle points of that deformation. Okay? That will in general give you a system of equations that has a non-trivial space of solutions. That will be the localization locus to which the infinite dimensional integral localizes to. And then we'll have to compute the fluctuations, the one-loop fluctuations of this deformation term around this non-trivial saddle point. Now, in the, in, the, in the example yesterday, the deformation term was uh, quadratic. So the one-loop determinant didn't depend at all on where you were, in the, where, where you were in, the, in the space of saddle points. So the contribution of the one-loop determinant was a constant. So that was very simple. Here it will not be a constant, but it will be uh, a, a more non-trivial, you have a, a non-trivial kernel that will you have to integrate over the space of uh, saddle points. Okay. So I'm going to use heavily the fact that the vector multiplet is Q exact. So that means that I can use the vector multiplet garantian that I already derived as a deformation term. Okay, so use which is Q exact as a deformation term. But this is nice because I, I, here is the Lagrangian, okay? And now it's very easy to look at this. We have to look at the space of zero energy saddle points of this configuration. Okay. So what are they? I read it in a way that was suggestive. I wrote it as a sum of squares, right? <coughs> so it means that every term here has to vanish. Okay? So let's write the space of saddle points.
So we are on the two sphere, and phasemally on the two sphere, you can thread through the two sphere non-trivial magnetic flux. Okay. So the, actually, the, the 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 space of saddle points will have a continuous component and a discrete component, and we'll have to integrate over the continuous component and sum over the discrete one. Okay. So the space of saddle points is parameterized by magnetic flux through the two-sphere. Okay? So it's quantized flux. It's like having a magnetic monopole sitting at the center, if you wish. Okay? Now, this equation tells you that sigma 1... Well, this equation tells you that sigma 1 and sigma 2 have to be zero modes, right? I have to keep the zero modes on the sphere. All higher harmonics are, are, uh, do not contribute. This equation tells me that sigma 1 is completely fixed in terms of the magnetic field. Okay? So I know that sigma 1 is... Uh, my I think I have some cookie minus sign somewhere, but okay. Uh, let me believe that sign. Uh, okay? So one of the scalar fields is completely fixed by the quantized magnetic field. But now I have an z uh, arbitrary zero mode for the other scalar, sigma 2. Okay. So I have A. So sigma 2 is A, is a, and this is a zero mode on the two sphere. And uh, A and B have to commute. Okay. So what have we accomplished here? We have reduced the infinite dimensional path integral of this uh, gauge theory to an integral over dA. So dA is a zero mode. A lives in the vector multiplet. And you can always diagonalize it by a, a, a gauge transformation. And so the path integral has been reduced to, to the Cartan sub algebra of the gate group. So if your gate group has rank R, I went from a super duper infinite dimensional integral to an R dimensional integral that is parameterized by the zero mode of the scalar on the two sphere. But I also have to sum over all fluxes. Okay? So this uh, is the integral, in, if you, you, you will, the domain that we have to integrate over. Now, what is the next step? So we have identified the saddle points. Now we have to do two things. We have to evaluate the action on the saddle points. Well, that's easy. That's easy. Uh, and okay, that's that's the easy part. So, so remember the recipe of localization. Now is that we have to evaluate now. the Lagrangian on the two sphere on the saddle points. So that's just straightforward. We know, we, we know the Lagrangian super concretely. And I, I didn't write the Fayelia plus term, but th there's obviously the Fayelia plus term that we described before and the theta term. So that's easy. But now we have something that's non-trivial because the Lagrangian of this theory, which is the deformation term in this case for the vector multiplet, is definitely not quadratic, right? So what do I have to do? I have to take this Lagrangian and expand it around the saddle point here, and then compute, integrate out the fluctuations. What do you get? You get a system of determinants. And this is like a standard field, field theory thing. It's not, a, it's not a huge deal. But you get a, a determinants that depend on uh, the, 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 the zero mode, essentially. Okay? 
Now, how do you compute these determinants? Okay, so we have to compute the This will give the measure of integration of your uh, localization integral. Now, this, there are several techniques of doing it. I, f I found, and that's how we did it anyway, that th this problem is simple enough that you can do it just by, by um, doing the most nice thing, which is you have a differential operator on the two sphere, okay? That has magnetic flux on the two sphere. Well, how, how, how do you solve the Laplace and the Dirac equation on the two-sphere? How do you find the eigenmodes? We have to find the eigenmodes of these operators on the two-sphere. What do you do? You use uh, spherical harmonics. And then you're going to get a product overall eigen of overall eigenvalues of uh, the various modes that you get. Now, there is one wrinkle that w maybe goes slightly beyond what you have done in undergraduate quantum mechanics is that we have a non-trivial background gates field here, right? We have magnetic flux through it. So the right is harmonics that they analyze the Dirac or the, the Lambertian operator coupled to gates fields when you have magnetic flux, it's, uh, there, is a there, there is a there are special functions that, that they analyze those operators and they're called monopole spherical harmonics. And this was solved like Hundred years ago, by you, uh, uh, was it Wang and uh, Yang and someone? Anyway, this is generalizing the say the Dirac operator to the Dirac operator coupled to a connection that generates a magnetic field. There are the the, the right eigenfunctions for that operator are the monopole. It, it is almost identical to the. Uh, to the usual spherical harmonics, but there's a contribution for the magnetic flux, okay? And uh, now what are you gonna get? You're gonna get a product over all eigenvalues for all the Fourier modes <coughs> for all fields. So for the vector multiplet fields and the chiral multiplet fields. And this product over all eigenmodes miraculously combines into a nice function. So that, was, that makes you very happy. Essentially what you get by doing, it, essentially by when you when you do the product of all eigenvalues of all these operators, you f you find expansion of this type. You have product for, from m from one to zero to infinity. I'm being a schematic here, of things like z plus n. Okay. Now, what is this function? It's one over the Euler gamma function. The gamma function has poles at zero and negative integers. This is the famous product representation of the Euler gamma function. Okay? So by combining all these, all these uh, eigenfun eigenvalues of the Dirac, Laplace, blah, blah, blah operator on the two-sphere, we generate all these uh, gamma functions. Let me write what, what, what the answer is. I have not done the exercise in front of your eyes to expand on harmonics. That would, that would not be useful. But it's completely, it's completely straightforward, and you can look at our, our paper if you're interested. Okay. So let me write what the final answer is. So the answer will have, of course, this, the domain of integration that I already described, the integral over the zero mode over the Cartan, the integration over the flux. You have to, be, you have to worry about gates fixing, blah, 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 blah. This gives you a factor of one over the dimension of the wild group of the gate group. Okay? Whenever you do this gate fixing, you have to, you have to divide, divide by the volume of residual gate transformations. Now, what is the first contribution? I have to evaluate, I have to evaluate the action on the two-sphere on the saddle points. Obviously, the contribution of the action from here is zero, right? Because I define the saddle points as the zeros of this. But uh, remember, that I had the FI parameter and the theta term, okay? So I have to evaluate the FI uh, parameter and the theta term there. And that gives this nice combination. So it's e to the two pi i tau. Remember that tau was theta over two pi plus i zeta. 
we remember that theta is, was a topological angle. Oh, by the way, I didn't really explain what the, okay. And zeta is the phi Heliopolis parameter. So zeta had a, we already described what the interpretation of zeta was from the point of view of string theory. This had to do with the Keller parameter. And roughly speaking, you have a, a Keller parameter for every two cycle that your Calabiao has, okay? Now, what is the interpretation of theta? Can someone try to guess what the interpretation of theta would be in string theory? It's the B field because a string naturally couples to a two form and if I integrate the B field over a two, for, over a two cycle, it produces exactly periodic, you get exponential. So that theta is precisely measuring the B field. So if you were a, if you were a point particle person, you would think that the, uh, the world was half dimensional of what string theory sees. The string theory sees this extra B field direction that plays a very important role in things that I don't really have time to explain. But that, for example, when you study this uh, modular space of Calabiao, there are certain singularities, geometric singularities, where you would die because you're, you're collapsing. But because you have a B field, you can evade them by going around it, essentially. You have, instead of having a line, and there's a singularity here, you have a cylinder. So you can avoid the singularity by doing, epa, like that. And that's one way in which string theory resolves, one of the slogans you hear is string theory resolves space-time space time is, is space singularities. That's the way it does it, okay? Through the B field. So the fact that the string has an extended object, uh, is, is extended, plays an important role in these uh, pictures. Okay, enough of the slogans. So, uh, so let me, so I'm still evaluating the classical action on the saddle points. And then I have Minus b over 2. Just to be clear, this is just, let me write it in more directly, minus 4 pi i zeta a plus i theta b. But I write it in a way that, oh, this should be tau bar, okay? In which I make, I write things in terms of ho the holomorphic coordinates that would co uh, correspond to <coughs> complexified Keller parameters, okay? So that's just the evolution of the classical action. And now comes the the contribution of the one-loop determinants. So let's first look at the contribution of the vector multiplet. You have to complete the one-loop determinant. You have to integrate out the, all, the, all the fields. So you do it multiplet by multiplet. Let's look at the contribution of the vector multiplet. So I have a gate group G, and you have to look at the contributions of the various modes in the gate field. You can parameterize your Lie group in terms of the Cartan and the roots. Okay? So I'm just going to assume that you know what these words mean. And so the one-loop determinant is, is the product over all, all positive roots of alpha dot A, where alpha is the root, plus alpha dot B square divided by 4. And this thing, oh, sorry, square, like this. Now, if this guy was not there, this is something you've seen before. This is called the Van der, Mo Van der Mond determinant. If you ever studied matrix integrals, when you go from when you go to the, to the eigenvalues, you have a, a measure, contribution, which is precisely the Van der Mond determinant. Here, because of we're coupling the system to magnetic flux, there is an uh, initial contribution from the magnetic flux. Okay. So this is the one Z1 loop from the vector multiplet. So, so far, everything is super explicit. Okay. And now we'll, co we'll come to the, the, the most interesting part, which is the contribution from the matter, from the chiral multiplets. Okay. So the, remember that the chiral multiplet is are labeled by a representation R. This is probably gone already, but oh no, here, wow. Okay, so representation R of G. Okay. So the contribution again will be instead of the product of overall of overall roots, it will be the product of overall weights. Representations come in weights in in, in, in the weight lattice. So you're going to have the product of all weights of the representation R of a ratio of Euler gamma functions. So let me write it. Euler of gamma minus I omega acting on I plus IQ over 2 minus WB over 2. So uh, Q was the thing that I glossed over here, which is the R charge of the chiral multiplets. Okay? divided by gamma of 1 plus i omega i plus oh, 
I should finish, right? I think. But let me let me try just to f a f so conclude in a, in a reasonable way. The, and this guy with the contribution is a contribution of Z1 loop of a chiral multiple. Okay. Okay. So that's it. We reduce the two-sphere partition function of a of that integral to this finite dimensional integral. Okay. So that's that's good. Now, how do you compute this integral? It turns out that uh, it's actually rather easy to compute. Essentially, what you, you, you compute it by using Cauchy's theorem. Okay? So you have an integral. Uh, I thought I, I wrote somewhere. I didn't. Uh, okay, so you, you have to compute this integral. Okay? Now, this, this, the integrand has poles in the upper half plane and lower half plane. The gamma functions famously has poles, right? So given your theory, you put stars on all the locations of all your poles, okay? And how can you compute this integral? Now, depending on the sign of the Fi parameter, you can close the, the contour integral by enclosing all poles in the upper half plane or the lower half plane. So all that you have to do, and that, that will give you two different representations of the same answer. One, say, relating to what I said before, around large volume, and the other one are around a non-geometric phase, like a london Gisbrook phase. So all that you have to do is, and we know what the residues of, of, of the poles of the gamma function are, and that gives you a very completely explicit uh, representation uh, of the two-sphere partition function. Okay? And since I'm out of time, let, let me just emphasize that uh, this has several fun applications. The most, if you wish, remarkable one in the sense that it solves problems that uh, were unsolved before. That there, well, there was a major stamping block into continuing because people didn't know how to do mirror symmetry more generally. But uh, so let me just come out. There are many, but I'll, I'll focus on two that are kind of fun. Oh, by the way, this can be done also for massive theories and uh, so on and so forth. But let's not worry about it now. So let me just finish with two applications. So one is to the computation of the Keller potential. Here I've done K twisted chiral. We have also, I mean, you can also define the UV theory that would have computed K chiral. And in that way, you get a completely explicit representation of the uh, the complex structure moduli space. Now here there is a fun thing. I, I, I said in that, that for the twi for the for the um, Keller moduli, there are world sheet, world sheet instanton corrections to the to the Keller um, potential. And th that was one of the fun things uh, that gives rise to this Gromov with an invariance, a topological invariance, and and that's one of the applications that this has had, so the computation of these M betas. Okay. Now, one thing that is also known is that the killer, the complex structure modular space is, is exact. If you wish the log in Calabiao language, the log of the killer potential is the integral over the Calabiao manifold of the top holomorphic form times omega bar. Okay? So me not knowing anything about fancy math, I mean, uh, this kind of a approach gives you a way of representing the integral of omega times omega bar geometrically in terms of some ultraviolet gauge theory data, and it, indeed it gives you on the nose, as it should have by the theorem I, I proved, the, exactly this thing. Okay. But of course the most exciting thing is that it allows you to compute uh, gromov witten invariance for uh, geometries in which there is no other technique to even tackle the problem. And another one... Maybe you're right, yes, you're right, yes. Thank you. And the other one is that um, the partition function of the two-sphere actually computes, uh, can, can be identified with correlation functions of something that is completely different. And actually, she, she mentioned that she used the word Liouville theory. There is also some, something called TODA, which is kind of a higher rank realization of Liouville. The S2 partition, partition function can be identified with correlation functions of a non-supersymmetric 
non-rational CFT uh, like Liouville and Todo. And this has read some, some, some interesting way of representing, in particular, conformal blocks in terms of uh, the quantities that are spit out by this theory that are called vortex partition functions. If I had had more time, I would have uh, showed you that uh, if you care about four dimensions, that many of the techniques that I described here would allow you to compute exactly also the, even there it's mo much less explicit, I will compute the, at least give you an integral representation, a finite dimensional integral representation of the simplest non-holomorphic observables, local observables, in 4dn equals 2 theories, which would be, the simple example would be the two-point function of a chiral operator that preserves a collection of supercharges. I believe you, you have seen what a chiral operator is. It preserves the Qs but not the Q bars, times an anti chiral operator that preserves the opposite charge. Okay. So this is an operator that does not preserve any of the Poincaré supersymmetries because this kills, this kills Q bar and this kills Q, so that in total kills everything. But nevertheless, by going through the sphere, you are able to compute this exactly using uh, Suzy's localization. But this will have to be in some other year. Okay, thank you. Yes, because the, the two, com yes, so, so wh why do I need the 2,2 two theory in the UB to have a non-anomalous U1 asymmetry to flow to uh, N equals 2,2 SCFT? Essentially, the point is that the N equals 2,2 SCFT has a U1 axial R symmetry, so it should be there. And you have an anomaly, it's not there, essentially. It's, 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 it's roughly, that's essentially the argument. Thank you. Yes. The point is that even you take the special value, this is zero. I know what you said, but the, the point is if you quantum mechanics, I know a ground state.